Hello, my name is Patrick Hannaway. I'm a board certified family physician. I'm a board certified physician in integrative and holistic medicine. And I'm also a Marakame. A Marakame is a shaman in the native tradition of the Huichol people of the Sierra Madres in Mexico. I've been initiated in that tradition as part of my healing practice. Today, what I'm going to talk to you about are aspects of healing, Native American healing and transpersonal healing, a way of connecting to the larger consciousness that's there and present with us at all times. The term transpersonal healing and transpersonal psychology arose from Carl Jung. Jung, who was working with the collective unconsciousness, talked about transpersonal consciousness as a way of relating across people, across space, across time, in terms of understanding and connection, connecting to that which helps the healing process. We are connected to a greater unconsciousness in our whole lives, a greater consciousness in our whole lives. For, for that, we have the opportunity to be able to connect, to learn, to grow, to heal, not only ourselves, but the patients and the people who we see and interact with. The term transpersonal psychology was coined to understand the relationship of, between transpersonal healing, the collective unconsciousness, and psychology by bringing aspects of consciousness, of mind-body healing, of transformation, and of spiritual inquiry into the process of healing. Now, Jung was an amazing uh, person who was a, a disciple or a, a student of Freud, uh, took some of his ideas and brought them into entirely new light because of his life experience. And that's what helped him to be able to connect to the ideas of consciousness as it relates to spirit, spirituality, and religion. What happened for Jung was in 1913, he had a dream. And in that dream, there was a massive flood. And that flood covered Europe, and it covered his native Switzerland. It destroyed things. Buildings were crumbled, and then everything, the water turned to blood. He was deeply disturbed by this dream, not understanding what did it mean. He'd spent a lot of time working with dreams and trying to understand and connect to what was the meaning of this. He was actually afraid that he was going crazy. But then, in August of that year, there World War I began, and the destruction and the bath and flood of blood that occurred could not get out of his mind that he had tapped into a collective unconsciousness and awareness of what was coming in the months to come. Now from that time on in 1913 through 1928, he began to really closely follow his dreams, take copious notes, work to understand, and these formed the foundation of all of his future work. He worked with the inner guide. He had a, a wise elder, a guide, a spiritual guru who came to him in his dreams. He had a young girl, an anime, that was the counterpoint. See, there was a, an old leathered uh, being that came that was kind of the wise guy in the picture that, that sort of was a counterpoint to his ego, trying to help him to see things. So he used these inner, gui inner guides in order to be able to help frame what he talked about and brought forward as transpersonal psychology and transpersonal healing. And he asked the question, do you want to be good or do you want to be whole? Recognizing that healing is wholeness that the root of the word heal is the word whole. And to become more whole means it's not just whole within my body and being, but whole within my relationship to all that is on this earth and in this universe. And having connection and awareness of that, we'll see that these qualities can and are used as healing tools, as awarenesses within many other traditions. Take, for example, the shaman. The shaman as noted within indigenous tribes and groups around the world for as far back as we see. We see the cave paintings in Lausanne, France from 35,000 years ago that describe the work of these people. Healers are a part of man 
you know, for the last 800,000 years. We know this. We see that fire has been around and we connect to the fire for that period of time. It's through the evolution of consciousness and connection with each other that we began to see and feel these greater connections into the process of healing. Now, the, the forms of transpersonal healing that I'm talking about here as shamanism are also present in the Taoist masters of Chinese medicine, in the Ayurvedic Vaijas who've been present there, in, in the teachings of the Vedas and the Upanishads, in the teachings of even Jesus Christ acting as a healer and looking at what was happening through his work with fasting and connecting and, and performing miracles. These are aspects of transpersonal healing where there's a connection to a greater whole. And that aspect as it relates to prayer and connection and community are important aspects within indigenous healing systems and aspects that Jung has brought forth as we begin to see them with language that we can understand within our Western culture. So within shamanism, an ancient tradition that's been there, we see that the focus is on healing not only of ourselves, but of our families and of our communities and our environment. It's said that without a community, there is no shaman. And without a shaman, there is no community. So the relationship between these two things are intrinsic as we move forward in the process of healing. So here we see this Marakame from one of the villages in the Sierra Madres making offerings of thanksgiving to Grandmother Ocean, to Tate Hadamara, to recognize that all of the sacred beings, all of the Kakiyatis have arisen from the water and recognizing that all of the water, all of the rain, all of the streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, all flow into the ocean as the source of wisdom. So the Marakame is presenting the offerings of thanks and gratitude, of prayers, of the journey of pilgrimage to say, thank you for all that you do. And I offer you these aspects of me. I offer you my life to do the work because the work of a shaman is one that connects to the community. It's not something that you can walk away from. The work is never done. Now shamans use different tools. Some will do, use vision questing, pilgrimages as we see here with this Marakame, the offering of doing specific ceremonies, sacred dances, sometimes as a community, sometimes individually. Their work is to use their tools to connect across the veil, to be able to hear the divine and to be able to bring that forth into this world to help in the process of healing with an individual. They may access alternate states of consciousness. This can be done through drumming. It can be done through communal ceremony. It can be done through sitting and connecting to the fire. Many people are mis have a misconception that these altered states of consciousness occur simply through the use of certain kinds of psychotropic drugs such as ayahuasca or peyote. But in fact, there are many ways, including work that Stanislav Grof has brought forward on holotropic breathwork that allow us to move into alternate states of consciousness so that we can have awareness of things that our conscious minds aren't actually able to see right in the moment. So the shaman works as an interface, as a bridge, as a mediator between that which is sacred and that which was mundane. As one old Huichol shaman said, you know, last night we danced with the gods, today back in the cornfields. It's the equivalent of the Zen, chop wood, carry water. Before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. The relationship between the sacred of what we see as sacred and the mundane is actually there in front of us all the time. And everything that is mundane is sacred in and of itself. So we see that, that the person who becomes a shaman may receive a calling in some way. Most people that I've met who uh, have been called to be shamans, they don't want that job. They're not looking for that lifelong interface with helping people 
in every way possible. But it's a calling that is from the heart and one that, you know, when is answered, allows great gifts of healing to be able to come forth. Because it creates a doorway of connection into the divine, into the vast unknown, into the collective consciousness to be able to see and feel how to bring these gifts forth, how to help each individual or a community to be able to bring the gifts forth. So there's an intimacy of exchange, particularly with nature, but also with the forces of dreams and the environment as a whole. It's about listening and being totally present. The Aleutian elder, Larry McCurlyf, you know, talks about being six years old and sitting on the Pribilof Islands in the Aleutian chain with his acha, with his mentor, and with the other men in the community and saying, how do they know when the sea lion is going to come out of the water so that they're ready at the singular moment that that sea lion presents itself? And it's because they're present with all of the signs and all of nature and everything that has to give. So too, within the Weichel tradition, the deer offers itself as a sacrifice. The shaman in the rites of initiation goes through this taking of a life in order to recognize the power of life and the power and responsibility, the karma, if you will, of taking that on, of then using that as a driver to help their people over time. So we can see that one of the key aspects of the, of the work of the shaman is about having right relationship. And that right relationship is with people, with their family, with their community, with the animals, with the rock people, with the weather beings, with the ocean, with the sacred sites, and with themselves, with all that is. That right relationship in body, mind, and spirit is required in order to be able to allow for the hearing, the seeing, the learning, the knowing to occur. So as we see that balance it's talked about commonly within the four directions of north, south, east, and west that are called, within the elements of earth, water, fire, and air. These are ways in which we can relate to the natural world as it exists. Within our culture, we may often ask the question, which way is east? Not even knowing which direction the sun rises in. We've become disconnected from the earth, from nature, from the knowing, from all the wisdom that's there. So as we see here in this balance, it's a way of connecting back to life itself, not the virtual life of this computer that you're looking at, but of life itself, of all connection. And technology is a part of that as well, but it's not the answer. It's a simple tool that we can use. So I like this Navajo proverb about connection, about knowing. I have been to the end of the earth. I have been to the end of the waters. I have been to the end of the sky. I have been to the end of the mountains and I have found none that are not my friends. So Buckaroo Banzai said, wherever you go, there you are, right here. And so we see the teachings of the Taoist masters, of the Buddhist masters, of the Hindu masters, of the Native American elders, of the Native traditions from around the world, from the Maori in New Zealand to the Aboriginals in Australia. Each of these traditions knows and understands and connects to the right relationship. And in that right relationship, that includes a relationship with our ancestors and what's gone before. But in that connection with what's gone before, there's also the awareness of what is to come and the recognition that my actions will have an impact on seven generations of children that come down after me. And when our choices and our movements in the world 
on a day-to-day -day and moment-to-moment -moment basis include the consideration of does this, Im does this action have any impact on seven generations of children to come? It changes what we choose as priorities and importance in our life. We take time to connect to each other, to love and care, to listen, to eat the food that comes from the earth and honor and thank the earth for that connection. We see the importance of, of rituals and ceremonies, of being at the wedding, of being with someone as they're dying, of supporting the mother in birth, of connecting to the elders and the, the lineage of the traditions that they have, but also of our elders who are stuck in nursing homes with dementia where they don't have the opportunity to be able to talk to people and remember their lives of what's gone on. We're a culture that is so obsessed with youth that we push that aside and we forget the teachings, we forget the connections and honoring those who've taught us. So here we see an inscription on the rock uh, at Oribe on the Hopi Reservation on the third mesa where there was a recognition that as we see in the upper left-hand corner, there were the people and their heads were disconnected from their bodies as they moved along. And through the time where we then see changes in the world, we have a choice. And we have the choice that when we see what to me look to be symbols of Nazi Germany, of nuclear power plants, and at this point in time we have a choice to go back to connecting to the earth and the planting of the corn and connecting to the divine or of moving off in a way that breeds chaos. We shall see. But when you lose the rhythm of the drumbeat of God, you're lost from the peace and the rhythm of life. And so the movement of sound and rhythm and connection is all a part of our connection, our connection to each other. You know, the Africans say that if you can talk, you can sing. If you can walk, you can dance. And even though the suffering and what we may perceive as poverty is there, the joy of connection to all that is in life remains. They have various tools that they use for helping to detoxify, to purify themselves of going into the sweat lodge, what the Yupik Eskimos call the mukik, or sitting in the fire circle, smudging and connecting to each other, or just sitting around the fire. The Africans call the fire African TV. I love it because it's like before there was TV, there was fire. So we've had TV for 60 years, 70 years, but we've had fire for 800,000 years. Where is more wisdom going to occur than in the sharing and interrelationship as we sit around the fire? How do we help our mothers who are delivering babies and our young men and young women who are, who are growing into adulthood to have awareness of what's going on, to have initiation that helps them to see that they are stepping through an important part of initiation. It creates a realignment of the soul, of the life purpose of what's going on. Because in an authentic initiation, we're able to make that bridge and connection between the mundane and the sacred, between the individual life and the collective life, and the collective consciousness that's present there. These tribes will also use dance as a way of telling stories, of joking, of connecting, but of remembering. Remembering the stories of the ancestors that have been brought down to them. It's, it's fascinating to me that when you go and you listen to the native elders of the Yupik Eskimo people and they talk about the waves of people who have come across that are completely supported by the archaeologic and the language records and the DNA records that have been. They know what happened 20,000 years ago to their people. And they know the relationships between their people and the other native people that are present on this continent. 
How can that be? But they do because they're listening. They hear. They connect. As we see in this picture of the Yupik Eskimos, they're playful in their dance. They poke fun at each other. They have joy in a setting of suffering, in retelling the stories of connecting and remembering. So we see that there is beauty before me, behind me, below me, above me, all around me. The Navajo say, in beauty I have spoken. And you'll notice that many of these elders and many of these teachings are brief. They don't say a lot of words. It's the experience of connection. It's the experience of moving into a different relationship with nature, with all that is, with feeling the energies of the people who are around us. In journeying, we can use guided imagery and other simple uh, sh household shamanic tools of journeying, such as drumming, to help us to be able to move and go into the lower world, the middle world, and the upper world, to receive different teachings, to have different awarenesses of what's going on around us. But in the native way, we're focusing on allowing nature to heal the person. How do we help the person to connect to all that is, to allow the healing, i.e., becoming more whole, to happen? as a part of their own experience and connection to life. And as that's happening, it requires witnessing. Can I get a witness? Being able to see what those interrelationships are. Because a therapeutic relationship is part of the process of any healing encounter that goes on the use of ritual and belief to help be able to support that healing process and a connection to spirit. Spirare, spirit. Inspiration, bringing spirit in to our being. So these are approaches and tools. And we see when we meet with these people, they're not out with websites talking about what they do and who they are and how great they are. The Muskogee elder, Sam Proctor, said to me, the people, the essence of their people is about humility, integrity, and humbleness. And I said, well, what is the difference between humility and humbleness? And he said, there are different aspects of the same thing. That is how important that quality is to our people. There's no ego in healing. There's connection. There's knowing. There's awareness of our place, our very, very small place within a very, very large world. So we can use aspects of transpersonal connection, of working with healers, and of prayer. The idea of prayer, of being able to help people at a distance, has been demonstrated in a number of very interesting studies on intercessory prayer in ICUs, in the Mantra 1 and Mantra 2 study, and looking at the effect that, that praying and having people pray for the prayers can actually make a difference in ICU outcomes and in HIV and AIDS. It's unbelievable. The connection that we have is far greater than any of us can imagine. So I'll tell just a quick story. And I was uh, going to give this talk a few years ago. And it was the first time I was giving this talk. And uh, I was going to sit by the fire at a friend's house. And I was on the West Coast. And uh, 
Another friend came and said that he was coming over and he had seen a hawk on the road that had been killed. And we took it and we collected the feathers and we put it into the fire at 7 o'clock at night, West Coast time. I went to go to give the talk the next morning. I got a call from my wife on the East Coast and she said, the weirdest thing happened last night. Our dog came in 10 o'clock at night at exactly the same time with a red-tailed hawk in his mouth, dropped it down in front of everybody. They built a fire, collected the feathers, and made an offering of the remainder of that animal. At exactly the same time, 3,000 miles apart, I and my family were doing the exact same thing with a hawk that had presented itself into our lives. The awareness of the interconnectedness of what's happening in our lives, of the synchronicity, is far beyond the capacity of our mind to understand. The capacity of those same forces to allow for, to promote, and to help with healing is also that great. So we can use these tools of prayer, of connection, of the healing encounter to help support the process that is, as the Bodhisattva says, to be of benefit to other people. So I ask you to remember that these concepts, the ability to be able to move forward and bring these energies, this awareness, this consciousness into practice is something that has value. If you're interested, I encourage you to open your heart and listen. Thank you.